The uh, newspapers detailed that they had a program of events planned. Uh, a song called Bluebird it was supposed to be sung by the boys and girls. A rainbow drill, which is uh, supposed to be performed by another group of children. I didn't know what a rainbow drill was. I found, I Googled it, and here's a picture from 1910 of some other uh, group that performed a rainbow drill. But apparently, uh, maybe it's still big in marching bands today, I don't know. But I, I didn't know what it was. There's a play, uh, I know I'm going to mess up the name, the Martin Pashures. Pashures? Pashures. Okay. I'll let Jesse translate the <laughs> pronunciation for me. Uh, the recitation by Venice U, my sister's best fellow. A uh, song, Why Did I Kiss That Fellow, sung by a quartet, and uh, a lot of songs by little girls, a love song by girls and boys at the end. This would have been the entertainment at the end of the festival that was planned. Uh, I've tried to find a lot of this information, actually, uh, thus far only through the internet. I found a, a recitation that was similar, it was called the Sister's Best Fellow. And I think that was pretty much uh, the, same rest, uh, the same piece of literature because it fit the, the dates and it was uh, found a lot in some of these other uh, similar type of venues that were listed on the uh, internet. The days prior would have seen a lot of prep work being done by uh, Mrs. Hadell, uh, the daughters as well as other women in the community. Um, also her son and her uh, and other sons, or men in the area would have been helping out. And of course there would have been rehearsals of plays and songs and procurement of foods and um, costumes and all in preparation. So what happened on the day of the, it was a Sunday during the fair. So I've kind of got a little bit of theory, I'm assuming that's pretty safe to assume they went to Mass in the morning. Uh, then they probably had a big meal sometime around noon uh, for dinner time. And then the, the fair itself was supposed to take place sometime around 5.30 in the evening. So there would have been some preparation that needed to be done ahead of time. So it's listed that a lot of the older parishioners were there making the ice creams with the old uh, hand crank ice cream kegs, uh, freezers. Uh, there would have been candies and cakes set up. Uh, bottles of pop in, in tubs, uh, stacks of sandwiches. Also, there would have been fixing benches out around the outside uh, to, to be sitting around. Um, the stage in the church hall was being prepared for the play later that night. And I wanted to note also that this was all taking place in the early afternoon. And in Baton Rouge that day, the temperature was 99 as a high and a low of 76. And in reserve across the river, it was a high of 97 and a low of 73. So this is the middle of a drought. The, dirt, the ground's all dirty. Uh, I mean, it's all, there's no vegetation, so it's a lot of dirt and dust being kicked up around. And it's very hot, and so I'm sure it wasn't the most comfortable of uh, situations when they're out there putting this, uh, preparing for this fair. As I said, it was supposed to be taking place a little bit later than that in the evening, assuming when it's a little cooler. And, uh, they would be going through the final dress rehearsals, the young men and women in costumes, and uh, children practicing their songs. So, now all of a sudden a storm uh, started brewing. The sky started turning overcast uh, just after 3 o'clock. The wind was picking up and kicking up dust on the boots and the benches. Um, there were reports of strange gray clouds that turned an ugly yellow, or dirty yellow, and then to an ugly pink, which I found an ugly pink color on the internet. And, uh, and it formed a strange light on the um, proceedings. Now, it's been noted that Father Fontaine had been praying for rain for a number of months. And so they were, they were actually pretty overjoyed at the fact that the rain was coming. So as the storm approached, the winds grew stronger. And uh, Dr. Waxback started urging everybody to start seeking shelter. And so a number of them went to the new church as well as a lot of them went to the old church. Uh, they brought in benches and ice cream as they were going in trying to get all that out of the rain uh, before it hit. There would have been heavy drops of rain. They started turning into a heavy downpour and then sheets of, blinded sheets of rain. Uh, it was noted um, that there, the levee, which was newly made, 
I'm assuming that at that point, with all the vegetation did, there wasn't, you had to probably keep making up the levee because the dirt would have been, even though it wasn't eroding due to rain, it was probably eroding just due to the wind and such, um, it was having to be made back up. And the folks were very actually joyful due to the rain because of the fact that they had had a drought for so long. So instead of being a putting a damper on the situation, they actually were happy about the fact. So they were actually hoping to, to get a little bit of rain uh, despite what the wood put up with it. Now, before I go into any more about the storm, I've always had a question, what did the old church look like on the inside? One of the things I've tried to do is, uh, like I said, if anybody knows of any interior pictures of the old church, please let me know. We'd be happy to see it. But uh, the best I could come up with is trying to compare it to some other churches in the area that might be similar. And uh, I've been doing a lot of business up in San Gabriel, Louisiana, and there's the oldest uh, Catholic church in the area out there. And so I've been driving by and talking to some of the uh, guys who work out there, and I noticed after studying this picture, you know, a lot of similarities with the windows to the church and the doors and actually just kind of, if you use your imagination, hopefully I didn't use too much, you can make a comparison between the two. And in 2007, actually, I think one of the hurricanes knocked the steeple off the top. Now, the only problem with, with my theory in, in some respects is the fact that the old St. Gabriel Church interior was actually built around 1773. And this out, out, outside uh, facade was actually built around 1887, uh, 1889. So uh, I got to go up and, and tour it, uh, Mr. Eugene LeBlanc and uh, Clifton. Norman took me on a tour and told me about the area. So um, when you look at, if you, if you kind of assume with the modifications and the makeup that it was made, you get some sense of at least what maybe the inside looked like from the standpoint of what those type of windows on the inside look like. And also with the, uh, the big wooden beams that made up the framework of the church would have looked like. There were just massive cypress beams. In this case, some of these beams obviously go back to the 1700s, but it would have been a similar type of design, I think, at least from a framework standpoint of the inside of the old church. And then some other pictures, I think the old St. Peter's had a similar sort of setup, and uh, St. Mary's in Chapel and Union. I got this picture from UJ, actually. Um, but going back a second, I think the basic setup maybe in the old church might have been with the main altar and two side altars as well. So hopefully it kind of gives you an idea maybe what you would expect to see in, in, in this. At least this is what I'm theorizing so far. Now as the uh, church was being, uh, as everybody got in, Albert and Stephen and Dale started closing the windows, assuming they were open for light and ventilation. Uh, there was a lot of joy and laughter going on inside. Uh, there were pews and chairs and ice cream freezers all brought in there because of the storm, as we know. Um, probably a piano and some uh, things to, for the musical accompaniment. There was noted that dancing was reported, although uh, amazing Elizabeth got some music now. Uh, <laughs> Waxback said that, she, that wasn't the case. But there was a report by Miss Zealand Waxback that her mother recalled singing, and there was a song they were singing, It Ain't Gonna Rain No More, was the song that they were singing. Actually, I found that. Here. But anyway, it was, it was very festive inside despite all that was going on outside. Well, meanwhile, as they were entering the church hall, Father Fontaine, someone noted that the big window of the rectory was open, had one blown open, and that they was concerned about rain getting inside the rectory. So they said, you need to go close your window. So he goes out, he left the hall to go close the window, starts walking back after he did through the blinding rain, and he noticed that from above the church, about the black cloud, and get down onto the, uh, above the church, the whirling clouds. 
And he recounted in the newspaper articles that the wind leapt upon him. And as he lifted his head, he saw the building leaning, the shingles coming, flying off. And he shouted to those inside, say your prayers. He said he saw the whirlwind strike the church and big, uh, force a big opening in the top and basically shift the timbers and the, and the, the beams of the church and violently tore apart. And it fell after upon itself, basically. And inside it was listed. Uh, there's been different accounts. If you read enough of the different newspapers, there's always a little bit different information. But they describe anywhere from 40 to 100 or even 140 people inside the old church hall when it took refuge. Obviously, this is not a picture of it. And Father Fontaine, uh, all right, so sorry. there's the next one. This is At that moment, he stopped in his tracks and he gave absolution to everybody that was inside the building. Um, there was about 10 seconds between the time frame where everybody started hearing the noises that were going on and the actual tornado struck. And there was noted that shrieks of, uh, of terror and of those who were crushed and dying were mixed with the sound and the violence of the tornado. Obviously, uh, everybody was surprised and uh, there was a lot of mixed reactions. The other Hedels apparently were all sitting together based upon other information. Uh, Arthur Hubble apparently pushed his mother, his sister, his cousin out of the way to save him, but he himself was struck down by a beam. Uh, Bershman was back to stand with his fiance uh, or sweetheart at a brick pack. He pushed her out of the way to save him, but she was uh, but he was struck down. And then it was reported that Marie Charles Square was with her siblings. When they heard the noise, she ran down to the main aisle, and her siblings went to her mother, and she got struck by a beam. And then Dr. Waxback apparently was nearby a window, and after it had collapsed, he was able to push his four children out, went back and found his wife on the and then also, but he's still looking for a subversion, not knowing what had happened to him. Now, something to think about with these beams are reported to be 12 by 12, 14 by 14 beams. Take those and they assume they're 20 foot long, take the density and figure out how much they weigh. They weigh anywhere from 620 to 840 pounds. It's just the sheer weight of them. So if you can imagine that being snapped by a wind and being forced down upon somebody, it's just devastating. But the big beams also helped protect people because of the way they fell, they ended up lodging against each other. So a lot of people actually didn't get the full brunt of it. Now, the other thing is that these ice cream freezers and pews also, if you were low enough, they also acted as a, a cushion, so to speak. They absorbed the, the hits. So a lot of people were saved by that. <coughs> Immediately, those uh, in the church were, who were unharmed, uh, in the new church were unharmed. But, uh, there was about 30 inside the old church who found themselves immediately on the outside after the collapse. Um, they were, a lot of them were all unhurt and initially stunned, but within minutes they began to start digging and helping out. And this is, the rain's still pouring down, they're out there and they're in shock, but they're trying to remove these beams and by hand, and obviously their hands are bleeding, um, and there's still even hundreds under the wreckage who are freeing themselves as well. Uh, the news of the tornado apparently spread very quickly by word of mouth, and there were calls out for all the boys and men of various races to come up and, and do what they could to help out. In addition, a lot of physicians were called to come <coughs> aid as well. And within uh, the hour, it seems, a hundred, hundred of folks came to, to help out. And within two hours, it's reported that every timber was moved 20 feet off of its base. So if you think about those weights I talked about before, imagine the massive amount of wood that was there, it must have taken several men to move a lot of these big beams. So it was a lot of, uh, you know, very Herculean, Herculean effort to move all that within a two-hour span. Not just to move it one foot, but to move it 20 feet even. Um, now, in addition to the rescue efforts, uh, a couple of notes have been made about the uh, efforts of the two doctors there. Uh, Dr. Waxback was there on site. 